She was born into slavery, but ended up becoming one of the country's most influential journalists. Her reporting on lynchings and racism were a beacon of light during the Reconstruction, and her advocacy for racial equality is a message that still resonates today. I'm talking about Ida B. Wells, the legendary writer and commentator on race and racism. Her journalism career was sparked by an act of defiance. Removed from a train after she refused to sit in a section reserved for coloreds, Ida wrote about it, and the article sent shockwaves across the country and launched a career that transformed the way we talk about the black experience in America. This weekend, relatives are planning a 151st celebration for Ida. She's also the namesake of the Ida B. restaurant opening at the Real News headquarters in Baltimore City, Maryland. To help us learn about this renowned journalist, I'm joined by her great-grandson, Daniel Duster. So, Mr. Duster, just to start off with, could you give us a little overview of Ida's career, what she's accomplished, and why we're still talking about her today? So, as you know, she was born in Holly Springs, Mississippi, 1862. Uh, to slaves, and so uh, the first thing that they did, that their parents did when she, um, when slavery ended, was to take her all the children to school. She was the oldest of eight. Um, as a result of her being educated, her um, what happened in until she was born in 1862, 1878, um, yellow fever uh, really decimated large parts of the South. So both of her parents died, and one of her younger siblings died as a result. So at the age of 16, she decided to get a job as a school teacher to help, help take care of her family. And it was a, a very bold move in that um, at the age of 16, she was taking care of five younger siblings. Another sibling had uh, passed away um, almost after childbirth. So it was her and, and five other siblings. So just the, at, at the age of 16 to decide to do that to me is incredible. At the age of 48, if somebody said, can you take care of five kids starting right now? Right. <laughs> I, right. I, I'd be more than uh, trepid about it. So um, she got a job as a school teacher, um, used to go uh, travel by train to uh, the school during the week and come home on the weekends. And the, the family did receive some support from others, uh, but she was the primary uh, breadwinner in the family at, at that time. Um, later on, she moved to Memphis to become a school teacher there and did that for several years. Um, in 1884, um, she was on the rail car and, um, you know, after slavery, supposedly everything was equal. So, but in Tennessee, they went back and then the laws were kind of up to the state. So what had been um, open seating for everyone became a Jim Crow law where they said the blacks needed to move to a different car. So she had purchased a first class ticket and the conductor came and said, hey, look, you need to move. And she's like, no, let's see, this is first class. I'm staying in this car. Mm -hmm. So the conductor um, tried to forcibly remove her and she bit him and put up a struggle. Wow. And again, she, at this age, she's literally like five, one, 110 pounds. Uh, so a, a petite woman at that at that time, and it took uh, two the conductor and two other men to forcibly remove her from the uh, rail car. And when that happened, um, actually the rest of the passengers cheered. So she put up mm -hmm. a fight. She's literally uh, clothes torn, some uh, bruises and scratches, and she's uh, highly upset. She's pissed, and so she decides to sue the Tennessee Railroad and actually won. And then that was, she won um, $500. That was later overturned, and she ended up having to pay $200 uh, later on in court costs. So that was um, her, one of her first experiences, um, you, you know, really saying, I, I, this, things aren't fair, I want justice. So uh, fast forward a few other years later, she was still in Memphis, a school teacher, and uh, wrote an article about the, uh, disparate and unfair practices of the schools because the schools were segregated. She said, you know, the white schools were receiving this amount of funding and the better buildings, better books, and the black schools uh, received less funding, less resources. So we don't we don't hear about that today, do we? Um, <laughs> so she was um, her she wasn't fired, but her contract was not renewed for the next teaching uh, uh, season. So she was somewhat forced into doing something on her own because she had was educated and had uh, good writing skills and uh, public speaking skills, skills. She became a journalist for the Memphis Free Speech and actually um, ended up uh, 
purchasing the Memphis Free Speech. So um, she was uh, part owner of, of that. And then in 1892, um, sh she had three friends who were lynched. And yes. these were um, upstanding men in the community. She was uh, it's Thomas Moss, um, Will Stewart, Calvin McDowell, who were lynched. And she was so close to Thomas Moss, she was actually a godmother to his child. So she knew these men very well and knew that they were upstanding men. And at the time, you know, we didn't have the internet, we didn't have <laughs> much, uh, much in the way of, of media. So whatever was printed in the paper, people tended to believe. And so when other lynchings were printed, it's like, okay, well, the, uh, especially of black men, most of those were accusations of rape or, um, you know, endangering a white woman or white people. And so when she read that, you know, those stories, she believed it. When reading about, because she was out of town when the lynching happened uh, in Memphis. And she's like, no, these, these men are upstanding uh, guys in the community. So I know, because they were cute. What happened was uh, two of them were store owners, uh, the People's Grocery in Memphis. And there was a uh, racist white store owner who um, had a store that was just across the way from that store. So um, they... Bottom line is um, things escalate. There's con there's conflict. Things escalated. Uh, they said the uh, racist white people in the town said they were going to uh, burn down the people's grocery. So some black men took arms. There were some uh, fi uh, shots fired and ended up that a white guy ended up getting shot. So um, they rounded up all the black men <laughs> that they could in, in, in the town and put him in jail for a few days. And there was a black militia that actually came to Memphis to help protect him. After they found out the white guy was going to leave, live, they figured, okay, this is good. We'll leave. When the black militia left, uh, they went and got, again, the, the two store owners and Thomas Moss. So we took him out to a place called The Curve, which I've actually been there, and it's still got uh, a, an eerie feeling to it. Nothing's uh, grown in that area. Uh, no, there's no business, and it's still got a, a macabre feeling to it. So hearing about that and knowing that the men were upstanding, man, she was like, hey, we, some of you got to do something about this. So she wrote about, she investigated that lynching and found out that there were a lot of the prominent people in town who were involved in the lynching. So she started to investigate other lynchings. So she was kind of America's first investigative reporter, if you will, because you didn't have people that went out and challenged what was printed in the paper. And so she investigated over 200 lynchings in the South during those um, early, um, so this was 1892 when it happened. So during that early time frame, she did some investigations and found out that, wow, you know, a lot of these accusations of rape and, uh, were not, didn't actually happen, or sometimes it may have been consensual. And so she published one document on that um, during that time frame, and then l later on published another document. But How was her work on lynchings initially received? What kind of impact did it have when it was published? Oh, so <laughs> um, it had a, a very dangerous effect for her in that she got threats routinely. She went out and, b and bought firearms, so she believed <laughs> in the right to uh, carry a gun. And that uh, she's like, hey, you know, if, if I'm going to go down, somebody else is going to go down with me. Um, and so she had influence um, across the South, especially. Um, when she wrote her last article about, um, the, the last investigative article about the, the lynchings, she happened to be in, in New York at the time, and it's um, suspected that she, when pub in publishing that article, she knew that all hell was going to break loose, so she decided not to be in town. So the uh, people in Memphis went and, uh, you know, destroyed her, her, her newspaper, and she didn't, and they said, hey, if whoever wrote this article comes back, we're going to lynch them too. So she was directly impacted. Uh, and again, things that we don't consider are the, you know, the life threats, but also the financial impact of she had a business that uh, brought about income and that was destroyed. So she happened to be in New York at the time, um, then went to Chicago um, and met a guy by the name of Ferdinand Barnett, who was a prominent lawyer in Chicago, and he had a, it was a lot to do with civil rights as well. He was uh, a widower. His uh, first wife um, was a very educated and uh, powerful woman, and she passed. And Ferdinand said that he wanted a, a fiery woman 
that he wanted to marry again. So when he met Ida, he was like, okay, you're the one. So they um, they met at the because of the Chicago the, the the World's Fair, which was in Chicago, 1893, and um, Ida was <laughs> uh, boycotting, wanting to boycott the World's Fair because of the lack of presence of the Negro in the, in the fair. Right. I um, mean, so she and Frederick Douglass were at odds. And so another thing that happens in history is that we kind of assume that the prominent leaders got along or had similar philosophies. And in this instance, uh, that was not the case. She and Frederick Douglass, um, kind of like Malcolm and Martin, wanted wanted freedom, but willing to do different things to in order to do it. So Frederick Douglass's mindset was, hey, if I deserve a loaf of bread and you have a loaf, if you give me half, then that's good. That's progress. And Ida was like, no, if I deserve a whole loaf of bread and you give me half, you still owe me another half. So... Um, they, they went back and forth about how to uh, approach the, the racism that was happening in the country at the time and uh, whether to boycott the World's Fair, whether to be at a, uh, So Frederick was like, let's have a positive presence. And, and she was like, no, let's boycott and have distribute pamphlets indicating that this is not fair and um, this is how the black Amer- this is how the Negro is treated in America. And so she did a lot of things like that to um, bring to light what was happening in America. So... Um, all, after her friends were lynched, she actually traveled to Europe to instigate boycotts against the U.S. Um, at the time, again, the U.S. was the largest exporter of cotton, so she went to England and Scotland to really bring light to what was happening. And again, what was happening with lynchings, uh, it was really, in my estimation, America's first form of domestic terrorism, because it was about you know, during slavery, you can co- control black people or the Negro through slavery. After slavery, there was no legal way to do that. So how do you control somebody? With fear and intimidation. And that was what lynching was about, was fear and intimidation. That's why it was always a public spectacle, um, hanging, you know, sometimes dragging uh, the victims through the streets, whether uh, by horses or, you know, sending a message that if you step out of line, this can happen to you too. And th- oftentimes they take pictures of the lynchings. Uh, kind of like, you know, if you see, see somebody that goes on a fishing adventure and they got a big Florida marlin, they're standing like, hey, look what I have here. This is what they do with lynching victims. You'd, you'd have uh, crowds of uh, tens, hundreds, even thousands that would witness the lynchings. And then often t- it was a family event. There are several photographs with, you know, little girls and boys with their mothers and fathers right. witnessing the lynching. And so she took these pictures over to Europe and said, hey, look, this is what's happening. Uh, we need to uh, boycott. And so bringing shame to America, because America is founded on, you know, life, liberty, and the uh, pursuit of happiness, and uh, freedom and justice for all. And she was like, no, so ju- the justice is not happening for the Negro in America. So those are some th- prominent things that uh, launched her career, you know, launched and forced it and gave her passion about uh, justice and, and against lynching. So take a pause there and see if you have any other questions. Sure. Um- as an educated black woman, as a successful black woman, wasn't she under essentially constant threat of death? I mean, her three friends that were lynched essentially because they were successful black businessmen. Absolutely. And that, that was, again, the challenge. So uh, going back to her, her, her newspaper being destroyed um, and then doing, you know, coming to Chicago. And um, she, she did all of, all of her activism really on her own. She got uh, some financing from a few folks early on, but it was largely... That's what uh, she did because she had passion for it. Um, and again, the danger behind it is that sh- she didn't return to the South for years, for decades, um, because of fear for what would happen. So those are, again, Im- important things that happen. And I was just talking to a group of young men today asking about, um, so I-, I was at a venue that happened to have a picture of Ida B. Wells in the background, and I that's the same comparison. I'm like, so what's Rosa Par- Parks known for? It's like, oh, starting the civil rights movement. And I talk about, you know, I think America's done a disservice to itself, to our people, by not talking openly about the atrocities that have happened in the country. Uh, Because we've got a a barbaric, violent, sadistic past. Yes. And so to acknowledge that and say, hey, hey, look, you know, we're we're sorry for it. And again, this is, I think it's natural for people to do so. if you were to say, hey, Dan Duster, write your biography, there's some things that I wouldn't, if, if I didn't like it, I may not include, 
right? Mm -hmm. And so America's done the same thing. And again, the history at the point was largely written by white men. And so uh, not only were uh, the the atrocities that happened in America uh, minimized, but the success and the courage of black people, and especially black women, um, were not going to be accounted for because that's white man's history. In her piece on lynch law, she mentions that most of the media outlets were owned and controlled by white Americans, like you said, history mm -hmm. being written by white men. A hundred years later, very little has changed. We have a few minority-owned media outlets, but they don't have the far-reaching powder of their, white, of their white counterparts. So the narrative is still controlled by white editors at white-owned stations, white-owned distri distribution channels. How important do you think it is that uh, black people tell other black people's stories? How important is it to have black journalists? So both uh, black journalists and quality journalists. Right. So um, that, that's, that's the other thing is to have uh, quality reporting and a depiction of, of what's happening. So again, the, the, the challenge in the U.S. is you've got over 90 percent of the media owned by six companies. And so that that's going to have heavy influence. So for there to be quality reporting, whether it's a black-owned media or or one of the major stations to say, we're, here's what we're going to report, and give an angle that reflects, you know, the the truth or the, at least the truth that isn't told by the other stories, because you know, as with the court, you can say there's the truth and the whole truth. So sometimes they tell the truth, but it's a portion of the truth where the whole truth is going to give you the actual picture of what happens.